with Hovercraft is um, for a couple reasons. One, I really wanted to um, hear what you guys are doing because this is another area where we don't have any good research to support the practices. But two, I think that at least priming the pump for the soil health discussion with some cover crop discussion is really important. And I feel like for a crop as valuable as garlic, it's really important for us to focus on the soil um, before we get that garlic in the ground for as much time as possible. So that's really my angle on all of this. So these are the things I wanted to talk about briefly. Like I said, it's going to be quick. And I really want this to be an interactive discussion with all of you. So feel free to throw out your ideas. Um, but really, I wanted to talk about um, a few things that we've already touched on. Um, the idea of supplying nitrogen for the cover crop. Um, I think it's important that we do talk about weed suppression, as those of you that have caught our talks over the winter um, have been harped to death on. Uh, weed pressure is probably the biggest problem that we're seeing in the industry as far as yield suppression. So we could have a whole garlic school on that, but we chose not to this time, but I wanted to touch on it. And then the idea of, of just building your soil, building the structure, building the till, so that you can grow good garlic, and even so you can grow better cover crops, I think is what I wanted to just touch on, and give you a little update on the biofuming and cover crops too. How many of you have ever thought about what it means to fix nitrogen? So I think it's so, so cool to think about nitrogen fixation, because what we're talking about is a plant forming a relationship with the bacteria in the soil, right? The legume, the nitrogen-fixing plant, actually encases bacteria in its root hairs. And those bacteria are what are able to secure the nitrogen that's in the air pockets of the soil and fix them to nitrogen that's available to the plant. So I think that's just such a neat idea. And one of the things I just wanted to touch on um, with this idea is that you really need to have effective nitrogen cycling in your soil, which means you need to have healthy, well-structured soil for legumes to do their job right. You have to have air pockets in the soil. You need to have soil that uh, drains well so that you can reach field moisture capacity so the bacteria can do their job. Um, you need to have good soil. So just something to think about. And the other thing that I just wanted to touch on is the idea that you should have the right microbes present. The roots won't grab just any bacteria to fix nitrogen, right? Each legume has specific bacteria that it will form a relationship with. And the best way to ensure that those are available is to provide them. So how many of you inoculate legumes? Or you plant? Have you noticed the difference? Yeah, if you actually dig up a legume after you have either treated it or not with inoculants, Carefully, if you think carefully, you can see the number of nodules that are forming. And you should see a difference if you've inoculated. So just some thoughts. The other thing I just wanted to touch on with nitrogen, before we get into the discussion part of this, is the idea of calculating how much nitrogen is actually available from your cover crop. How do you guys normally figure out how much nitrogen you're getting from, let's say, an alfalfa crop? Look it up. Right, yeah. You usually just look it up, right? So, during your ample amounts of free time, <laughs> this is something that you could do, which I actually think is really valuable, especially if your cover crop isn't at the yield you expect. When you've got a huge cover crop, or you've got an underperforming cover crop, this calculation will allow you to figure out how much nitrogen you can really expect from that so that you can pinpoint the nitrogen application. So if you're really, really geeky, um, you could use the method on the left. The way I've done this in the past is if you've ever had um, screens that blew out, you can throw one part of the metal part of the screen out into your cover crop, just measure it, that's a good way to do it, or you can build something. But you need a known area that you sample from. You cut all the cover crop down to the ground, and then you dry it until it's crunchy dry. In other words, you can snap it. It means all the moisture is gone. From that, that's basically the same kind of material you would get from a bag of an organic fertilizer or a alfalfa meal, right? So you're creating a little tiny patch of fertilizer. You take that and you dry it. You divide by the number of square feet in the sample area, and then you convert that over to acres. And that'll tell you how many acre or how many pounds per acre you got from your cover crop, right? So that's something you can do. The easier way. 
is the way on the right. So what you want to look at there is if you've got 100% cover, and this is 100% cover is kind of an iffy idea, right? You know, if you look at your cover crop from your car, it looks like it's 100% cover. If you stand in it, not so much. So I would recommend standing in it to figure out if you have 100% cover. Look down. If the ground is covered, that's 100%. If you have less than that, multiply by the percentage you think you have. So if you have 80% cover, multiply by 0.8. Okay? So the background here is that 100% ground cover at 6 inches is going to have about 2,000 pounds of dry matter as an estimate. Okay? And each additional inch above that is 150 pounds more. Okay? So let me give you an example. So let's say, and, and you guys can write this down if you're in the math. Let's say I have 16 inch tall vetch out in my field. And I've got 100% ground cover. I assume that that first 6 inches of the vetch has 2,000 pounds of dry matter, right? And then I've got 10 more inches of vetch above that. So each of those inches has 100, 150 pounds of dry matter, right? So that's 1,500 more pounds. So 2,000 plus 1,500 is 3,500 pounds of dry matter, right? Make sense? I hope so. I'll write it out for you. Okay, so, so you figure out how much your cover crop weighs. What does that mean? Who cares? This is what that means. The weight of your cover crop is going to tell you, you know, how much stuff you've got. But then you need to know how much of that stuff is actually nitrogen. And here's the estimates that you can use in general. So for an annual legume, prior to flowering, we're looking at 35 to 4% nitrogen by dry weight. If you go ahead and incorporate that at flowering, we're looking at 3 to 3.5%. 3 and, and if you get it after it's flowering, it's going to drop really quickly because all the nitrogen is going into the seeds, right? So really, you want to make sure you hit that um, at a key point before the seeds are starting. But the point is, it's never going to become available unless you can get it at immaturity because that nitrogen is then going to be held as a seed, which is going to make a new plant rather right? than released to the soil. So the nitrogen doesn't go back into the cycle. So as I was listening to Steve's talk, I started thinking about this. And I'm wondering, since we know that the nitrogen is going to become available in the fall and the plant doesn't need it, it seems like maybe we could wait as long as possible like, we really wouldn't want to get the legume plowed down prior to flowering. That we could wait, increase the amount of carbon that's in the legume, and have it actually become available more slowly. I don't know if that's true, but that was my thought during right? season. So we can think about that idea. That, 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 that's awesome. So now I just, that was all of the, the real vomiting information that you that I wanted to do. Uh, what I also wanted to do was talk about what you're doing. I know what growers may have on the but I'm curious what you guys are doing with your cover crops. First of all, how many of you have a cover crop in your garlic rotation? Okay. Is anybody doing oats and peas? Yeah. Okay, what do you like about oats and peas? Cows eat them. Yes, yes. And actually, that's, that's a great way of dealing with it because then you're applying cover. I love it. So, those of you that do oats and peas, are you doing it for the nitrogen or are you doing it for the soil building? Why are you using it? It's a little expensive, so there must be a reason. Uh, I'm trying to use it for, for nitrogen. The so, oat pea vetch mix. Yeah. Um, my time has been a little off over the last year or two, so I'm trying to you know, get it in the field at the right time. Because you know, like as you pointed out, you get to the seed stage, you're, you're losing some of your available nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So you're having it actually mature too early for your growth. Plant. Yeah, planting it a little too early. That's, you know, temperature issues and weather issues. Yeah, that, that is one issue with some of these, especially annual systems that we're running through a growing season, is we don't have a lot of control over when they actually finish their cycle compared to when they want to plant garlic. And you don't want to be incorporating them too early. Yeah, so that's, that's a concern. But we have quite a few growers in our area that like those sort of peas as well, um, especially if they have enough land. Go ahead and put that in the cover crop before the garlic. Um, anybody doing much? Uh, yeah, but not, not right before the garlic. Yeah, that's just a different point of rotation. Okay. Yeah. I haven't met too many growers doing much with garlic, so I was curious if anybody was. Okay. 
Okay. How about crimson clover and even crimson clover mixes? All right. Are there any other nitrogen fixing systems that you're using? Well, we use a triticale pea. Ah, We're yeah. doing that over winter. Yeah. Yep. I didn't mention much with triticale, but uh, quite a few growers in our area are very, very into triticale. So why are you using triticale? It's over winter. That's the only, okay. So you're using it the year before the garlic? Yeah. So it's ball triticale. Ball triticale planted with uh, field pea. And then before it, uh, you know, before it heads out, it's incorporated, and then usually a quick buckwheat before uh, planting. Yeah. Uh, and you're putting oats in before the garlic. as well, right? Yes, Sometimes. that's a strategy. Okay. All right. So you're doing a ton of cover cropping beforehand. The biggest thing with oats it used to be very cheap. It's no longer cheap for organic growers. Yeah. And. Uh, with winter kills. Last time we had, a, I think it was in the 90s, I was trying to remember this. I think we had one winter one time where the oats didn't winter kill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, I think it's zone seven oats are hardy too. We've had a couple winters that fit that bill. Yeah. If you didn't get this handout, what I'm handing out is a couple of pages from the book Managing Cover Crops for Profitability, I think it is, or Profitably. So if you're wondering, the price of cover crops is all over the place, right? It really depends on where you are. But this will give you some rough guidelines for seeding rates, um, costs per bushel or per pound, I guess, in there per pound. Um, it'll give you the differences between broadcast and drill rates, et cetera, et cetera. And what these cover crops are best for. So if you hear about what other growers are doing and you want to try cover crops, this is a resource just to touch on. If you want to know more about cover crops than you ever thought possible, this book is actually online. You can download the whole book and it's even nicer as a paper file. Uh, managing cover crops for profitability. It's on the top of the handout as a source. Yes, managing cover crops profitable. profitable. Is anybody doing any other kind? Yeah. Alfalfa and Timothy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's only because I, I usually have uh, two or three years of that hay, of hay crop. You tried some sweet clovers, but not easy to work with. Because they're dangly or? You set seed, you can cause a lot of problems. Very hard to find yellow blossom sweet clover. You can find white blossom easily, but not yellow blossom. Yeah. 